20 years ago when I was a kid, the family vehicle of choice here in America was the minivan. Now as SUVs continued to grow in popularity over the years, it forced minivans basically into exile and sales really started to decline. Now that brings me to the three vehicles that I have on my left over here, basically the modern interpretation of today's minivans. At the far left over here is the 2019 Subaru Ascent, the biggest Subaru the company has ever made. And of course, right behind me is the 2020 Kia Telluride, the biggest Kia the company's ever made and arguably one of the hottest new three-row crossovers on, in the segment. And then of course, on my right over here on the far right is the 2019 Volkswagen Atlas. Again, the biggest VW the company has ever made and it was a hot car when it came out uh, two years ago. So today I'm just outside of Seattle, Washington with the rest of the members of the Automotive Video Association for our annual spring run event. And the big question I want answered, if you guys have roughly $45,000 to spend, which one of these three big crossovers deserves your hard-earned dollars? That's what we're here to find out. So one of the main reasons why minivans quickly became uncool, they became soccer mom cars, were the overall design of those vehicles. Even today's modern minivan still kind of has a bulbous, just uncool factor that a crossover or an SUV just doesn't have. So let me start with the exterior design of the Subaru to start with. This is, again, the biggest Subaru the company has ever made. They really stressed that when they introduced this car last year. And honestly, its design is probably the weakest link when you look at the other two competitors. It just looks like a bulbous, just ballooned up Subaru Outback. Now, thankfully, um, design isn't necessarily what sells crossovers because the Subaru still is a relatively handsome car. All uh, this touring model that I have will have the LED headlights, which are steering adaptive. You have an LED daytime running light, an incandescent turn signal here, an LED low and high beam, and then you have LED fog lights. Now, the Subaru does make their LED headlights as optional. You have to at least go for the limited trim and up to get the LED headlights. And then, of course, you have the traditional Subaru grille here with their Hawkeye designed headlights, and then you have some gray cladding here. Overall, I think the design is a little bit on the conservative side, a little more minivan-like from certain angles, but hey, if you want a conservative look, the Subaru has your number all over it. Now, in contrast to the Subaru, the Kia, this is a car that really stands out in terms of its design. A lot of people will mistake this thing for maybe an Escalade or a Range Rover. It has a really nice presence to it, and especially when you look at the Telluride name kind of spelled out along the actual hood. If you guys are looking for LED headlights on your Telluride, you have to buy this SX trim. I'm not entirely sure why Kia limits it to this high trim level. You also get LED fog lights here. You have an amber illuminated daytime running light, LED low and high beams, and then incandescent turn signal. You have the biggest Kia Tiger nose grille at the front, which definitely looks really good on the Telluride. I think this is arguably one of the most handsome new three-row crossovers in the segment. Kia really nailed the design. It's gonna to continue to stand out for a long time. Now, in relation to this, the uh, Kia, the Volkswagen was technically one of the one of the first boxier entries, although Honda's Pilot uh, back in 2009 was technically the first boxy application, but this has a lot of styling cues from that second generation Pilot. VW, again, said this was the biggest Atlas they ever made. Unlike the other two vehicles here, VW gives you LED headlights as standard equipment, even on the base end so that's a nice value proposition here. You'll have LED daytime running lights, you'll have an uh LED turn signal down here, and then they also give you incandescent fog lights here at the lower fascia. Now, this particular one here is an SE, an SE R line with the technology package. It's a new trim uh, for 2019. It has a little R line badge here in the grill and a lot of chrome. I'm not sure I'm loving the chrome. I kind of wish VW blacked out the chrome, especially in the grill, because it's just a little too shiny for me. But let me know in the comments below which one of these three vehicles you think is the best looking. So from the side profile of these three vehicles, you're not gonna be mistaking any of them for minivans. For one, they don't have sliding rear doors and they have significantly more ground clearance because remember, SUVs are the cool soccer model cars. Now I wanna talk about the actual size of each of these vehicles 
All three of these cars, their brands say that these are the largest vehicles they've ever made. The Subaru is actually the smallest vehicle here. It's wheelbase at 113.8 inches long. It's just a couple inches or a couple ticks shorter than the uh, Telluride and an overall length of 196.8 inches long. This is literally around 0.1 inches shorter than the Telluride, but it's significantly larger than their previous three-row offering, the uh, Tribeca, which was again, a little bit of a tweener vehicle. Now the 20 inch wheels that you're seeing on this particular limited model do look relatively nice. They kind of have like a machine gray painted pocket. They're riding on 245 50 series tires. Again, all of these cars have 20 inch wheels. So that's something to keep in mind. That's kind of the norm with the overall uh, wheel design in today's market. Now at the back end of the Subaru, you can see its design is pretty unremarkable. You have an LED combination rear, rear taillight. You have this chrome strip that kind of cuts into the taillight, which is a little bit of a controversial element here. There's a lot of badging back here to show with their symmetrical all wheel drive. And then Subaru gives you a lot of cladding underneath here with a nicely integrated dual exhaust with uh, nicely integrated parking sensor as well. Now this limited model does have a power rear lift gate. That's always very important to have. And you can see in terms of the cargo capacity, the Ascent surprisingly had a very good amount of space when it first first introduced. You're looking at around 17.6 cubic feet of space with the third row seat up. So it's very usable. If you look underneath here, Subaru also gives you a very good amount of storage space. You can actually put the tonneau cover underneath here. And if you want, you can fold down the rear seats which are pretty easy to fold, just pull on one strap here. And then if you expand out and fold down the second row seat, Subaru says this will carry a maximum of 77 cubic feet of space, which is pretty class competitive. It's about what you get in the Toyota Highlander, a little bit less than what you get in the Honda Pilot. Now in contrast, let's move over to the, the Kia. Its profile is definitely a lot more boxy versus what you get in the Subaru. It's got these black 20 inch wheels, which are included on the SX trim. They're also riding on a 245 50 series tires. So basically the same, size wheel and tire on the Subaru. They're wrapped in a Michelin uh, tire, which is probably my preferred choice of tire. But as you can see here, lots of black cladding. This car has less ground clearance versus the Subaru, which is 8.7 inches. This one's around eight inches of ground clearance. So it's a pretty good amount still. Now you can see there's a lot more silver trim over here on the door handles around the windows and the Telluride's wheelbase is slightly longer at 114.2 inches long. So like 0.2 inches, but this is also 196.8 inches long. So it's a smidge longer than the Subaru. Now, now at the back of the vehicle, its design is definitely a little bit more interesting. I like the, the way the taillights look. You've got uh, almost a full LED taillight, except for the reverse light, which is just an incandescent. You have an LED turn signal and LED brake lights. You have these nicely well-integrated parking sensors with some silver trim and more black plastic cladding. The exhaust tip, instead of a dual exhaust, it's just kind of a single outlet dual exhaust on one side. I would prefer if Kia actually split the two up like what Subaru does. And then you can, you can see here again, the Telluride name is spelled out on the back of the vehicle, just like it is on the front. Now, in terms of the cargo capacity, even though this is about the same size as the Subaru, Kia rates this having more space in the cargo area with the third row seat up. With it up, you're gonna looking at around 21 cubic feet of space. Kia says it's the best in the industry, although the Chevy Traverse does offer more. That's a considerably longer vehicle uh, versus the Kia. Underneath the floor here, you do have the same kind of storage, the underfloor storage. So that's really nice. You could theoretically put, you know, six or seven people in this vehicle with most of their stuff, although they will have to travel a little bit light. If you want to fold down the seats, the Kia's is a little bit easier. It automatically folds down the headrest and then it folds flat. And this is a little bit more flat to me. And then if you fold down everything, Kia says this is rated at 87 cubic feet of space. So 10 more cubic feet of cargo space versus the Subaru. That's a pretty big deal, especially if you guys plan to fold down the second row and the third row and actually use this thing to carry your cargo capacity. Now, in relation to the other two vehicles, the Atlas is the biggest car here. And it definitely shows on the inside, which we'll talk about in just a moment. It's wheelbase at 117 inches long, is three inches longer than the Kia, about three and a half inches longer than the Subaru, and at an overall length of 198 inches long. This is the biggest vehicle here. This is almost like Chevy Traverse size, although the Traverse I think is around four inches longer. You can see the Atlas also comes with 20 inch wheels. This is new part of the R-Line package. That's a new option for 2019. They're wrapped in fatter tires, 255 50 series R20s on Continental tires. So I really like the wheels on the Atlas. I actually prefer them over the black wheels. It's on the Kia. I just think it's a nice, clean, simple design that goes well with the lines of this vehicle. This is definitely the most boxy car here. I think it's more boxy than the Kia at times, at least from certain angles. And then the rear is a little bit more bland. I think the Kia has the best looking rear end. You guys can let me know in the comments below which one you guys think. It's also got a chrome strip here that cuts between the two taillights. You kind of have an LED combination taillights. You have an incandescent turn signal, reverse light, but you have an LED uh, brake light. Down here, the Atlas also has these nicely integrated rectangular dual exhausts and no 
black plastic cladding. Instead, you have this black painted cladding, which definitely looks a lot more upscale. It's got more chrome trim on the bumper here. My tester has a towing package for $500. And then if you want to open up the rear lift gate, it also includes a power lift gate. Most of these cars have that. And the Atlas has about 20.5 cubic feet of space, so slightly less than the Telluride, which is surprising considering this is two inches longer. And then if VW says if you want to fold down all the seats, so if you fold down the third row and the second row, this will give you a maximum of 96 cubic feet of space, which is, again, 10 more cubic feet of space versus what you got in the Telluride. So that's a pretty big deal. This is one of the largest in the segment. You have to go up to a Chevy Traverse if you guys are looking for you know, the most space. Underneath here, VW also has under full storage, but it's not quite as deep as what you got in the Kia and the Subaru, so that's just something to keep in mind. So moving on to the interior of these three vehicles, I'm going to start with the Subaru, which getting into the front seat and shutting the door, it has an okay sounding door. It's a little on the hollow side, but it's not the salt, most solid sounding door I've heard. Remember, this is Subaru's global platform. It's basically an enlarged Impreza. Now, the rest of this interior will seriously remind you of an Impreza. It's got the same basic shape to the dashboard. But the one thing you're gonna notice immediately is this car is two inches narrower versus the two other cars. It's 76 inches wide. So it doesn't feel quite as open and airy. It's a little bit more cramped in here, but it's a little bit easier to drive. Now you can see here, Smart Access uh, push button start is gonna be standard on this limited model. I believe you also get it on the touring trim as well. So all you have to do is just put your foot on the brake, push the button here and the engine will fire up. Remember, this is a four cylinder engine. Now, I've given you guys a full review on this car already. Be sure to click on the link in the description below to see that. So I'm just going to touch base on the basics here. You've got the Subaru Starlink infotainment system. It's an eight inch display, Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. You have soft touch uh, injection molded plastic with some faux stitching along the dashboard. There's some uh, faux aluminum trim here. You have some more stitching over here with a little bit of storage. They kind of took that from the Toyota Highlander. The glove compartment in the Ascent also is okay in size. It's a little bit smaller. It is damped and it's lined with felt, um, but you also kind of have this additional storage here at the top if you guys want to store something that's in the glove box. The steering wheel you can see here is a manual tilt telescoping. It actually has a heated wheel function and the seats here are only heated. If you guys want cooled seats, you have to go up to the touring trim, which is like another $2,000 more. So that's something to keep in mind. The door panels here are also soft touch. And overall, the Subaru's design is very conventional. I kind of get into this car. It doesn't feel luxurious, but it doesn't feel cheap. It's pretty much like I can get in and know how to use most of the things. Um, this Starlink infotainment system looks pretty nice. Uh, it's got you know embedded navigation, which is kind of like a TomTom -tom navigation. I like the panoramic sunroof above me, which lets in a lot of light, which is really nice. The seats also, I think they're pretty comfortable. And they're also like an eight way power adjustment here on the driver's side with a two person memory. So hopping into the Telluride after just getting out of the Subaru, I have to say this thing looks like a luxury car. It has some essence of BMW and Audi and maybe some Mercedes in here. This is a really nice interior. It makes a great first impression. It also feels much more airy because this car is two inches wider. You're gonna notice that the door sounds really solid. It reminds me of a German car much more solid sounding versus the Subaru Ascent. Here's the key fob for the vehicle. It's basically the same key fob that we've gotten on a Stinger where the buttons are on the side. Just put your foot on the brake. The engine starts right up when you push the uh, button here to fire up the engine. Now looking at the infotainment system here, I've shown you guys the full review again. This is their 10.2 inch uh, Kia Uvo infotainment system. It has Android Auto, it has Apple CarPlay. It's also a touchscreen and the graphics to me just look a lot more crisp and clear versus what you get in the Subaru. So this definitely looks much more impressive. The map navigation display also looks a little bit better than what you get in the Subaru. It's really just because of that big screen. This has the biggest infotainment screen here. You have, you can see, some stitching, faux stitching along the dashboard. It's a soft touch plastic. You have this pretty uh, fake feeling wood. It looks relatively real, but it's all fake uh, wood and it's fake aluminum trim. That's what, that's what Kia told us at the media drive. It's hard touch plastic over here. The glove compartment you can see is damped and it's lined with felt. It's a little bit on the smaller side. And overall, the Kia's interior just kind of screams luxury from the heated wheel to the way the controls are all laid out. It's got a really nice, you know, cleanly uh, laid out center stack over here with the traditional shifter, wireless charging. When you put the vehicle into reverse, you can see it offers a 360 camera, which the Subaru doesn't offer a 360. If you guys go for the touring, it has a front camera, but it doesn't offer the full 360, but check out the resolution there. It's definitely the best one here in terms of clarity. So again, this all adds to that impression of quality. So for me, the Kia's interior is the most luxurious and it also feels one of the most spacious. Now above me, I also have a panoramic sunroof, but it's not the full length panel roof like what you get in the Subaru. Uh, instead, there's this area here that kind of cuts into the space, but I do love the uh, mouse for the Alcantara that's on the headliner. It just makes this thing feel super expensive. 
So last but not least, hopping into the Volkswagen Atlas. Typically that's a strong suit with VW, but I'm sad to report it doesn't sound as solid sounding as the Telluride, which sounds more like a German car. This is kind of in between the uh, Telluride and the Ascent in terms of the noise it sounds, it makes when you shut the door. Typically in the past, VW had the most luxurious feeling cabin. And I'm sad to report they're not really doing that anymore. Instead, the cabin just kind of feels familiar and just easy to use. Now you can see here, here's the key fob for the vehicle. It's the typical Volkswagen key. The button to start up the engine is down here. And then the engine starts right up for you. This is their six cylinder engine. Now in terms of the materials, you have a soft touch injection molded plastic here. That's the faux stitching. You have some pretty unconvincing looking and feeling fake wood with some silver painted plastic. And then of course, this is their eight inch Volkswagen Incarnet infotainment system. The graphics are nice. I like the completely, you know, the large glass bezel around the screen with the uh, two knobs that are integrated over there. It looks pretty good. The graphics are good. I would say this is right on par with the Kia in terms of clarity, but the screen is smaller at only uh, eight eight inches. Now the center display here is also not their digital cockpit display, which is basically taken from Audi, which is their virtual cockpit. You guys have to buy the SEL premium to get that. You have a steering wheel that also tilts and telescopes. Now keep in mind also, I'm in an SE, SE version and they do offer an SEL that has slightly more equipment. And because of that, I only have heated seats. I don't have cool seats. I don't have a heated steering wheel. Uh, you have dual zone climate control, which is like the other cars. And then over here on the center stack, the plastics just feel a little bit cheaper. It just doesn't feel quite as warm and well welcoming as the Telluride. Now the seats are also um, the soft, the leatherette seats. Um, they're only a heated seat, no memory seats because I don't have the full on you know, SEL premium. And then above me, there is no panoramic sunroof on this one. You can get that option where it's a full length, just like on the Subaru. Now over here on terms of storage, the glove, glove compartment is larger than what you get in the Telluride, but it's not lined with felt, it's just a damn clip. But overall, the VW's cabin is nice. It just doesn't feel the same kind of luxury that you get in the Kia. It's on the same page as kind of like the Subaru. So as family vehicles, the second and the third row are obviously going to be really important considerations. And the Subaru is really excellent in this category as well. As you can see, this limited model has captain's chair. Subaru also offers the option of an eight passenger configuration where you'll have a bench here. These captain's chairs are really nice in the fact that they slide forward and back. They have recline adjustability and the limited trim includes two level heated seats, which is, not, which is nice, your own set of climate controls. And then you also have two USB ports over here in addition to this nice little storage area, not really storage, but two cup holders that kind of fold down, which is good. I like the fact that it has this big pass through to get back here and the legroom is plentiful. It's like around almost the same as the front seats around 37 inches of legroom and you have a nice view from the roof of this vehicle. Now getting into the third row, you can also climb through the back here through the side or if you want, you can pull open that, uh, which slides the seat forward and he offers a pretty good amount of space to get into the back row. And when you're finally back here in the third row, the Subaru is definitely going to be the tightest back here. I'm five foot seven, the seat is now all the way back. So my knees, as you can see, are kind of brushed up against the seat back. You can move the seat slightly forward to give yourself a little bit more space, but just know that um, it's tolerable. This is more space than what you're gonna get in like a Highlander, the current generation. Um, and it's definitely not bad. Because the Subaru is a little bit more, na more narrow, you're not gonna be able to fit three across here quite as well, but you do have things like uh, two USB ports back here and some cup holders, so that's nice. Subaru, remember, said this car has 19 cup, hold cup holders in total in the cabin, which is something they're really proud of. So getting into the second row of the Telluride, if you guys want the eight passenger model, you have to go down from the SX trim because the SX currently is the only, only, the only trim that offers the second row captain's chairs. You can't get the eight passenger configuration. The one unique feature in the Telluride is the fact that the second row here are heated and cooled. That's part of the prestige package that my tester has for $2,000. You also have this sunshade here that opens up, which the Subaru also had. But the fact that you have heated and cooled second row seats, that's a segment first. The Palisade will also have the same feature. Now, in terms of the legroom, it's plentiful. It's actually a little bit more than the Subaru at 39 inches. You have cup holders here, you have a regular AC power outlet, and then a 12 volt outlet over here. And then you have two USB ports that are built into the seat back here, which is definitely a little bit different. Two map pockets and the seats themselves. They also slide forward and back and they have the recline function. So it's almost as comfortable as the front seats, which is nice. Now, because this vehicle is also wider, you can feel that, that extra two inches of width because the seats are a little bit further apart. And then above me, I've got this nice view from the panoramic sunroof, although I wish it wasn't all the way through, but the Kia puts the rear seat climate controls in the ceiling versus Subaru, which, put, which puts them down there in the center console. Now hopping into the third rail, because it's got this nice pass-through, I can kind of just crawl my way back here 
or you can also push the button over here which moves the seat forward. It looks like the space is pretty comparable to the Subaru in terms of getting back here. They took a page from Honda with that nice quick release versus the Subaru which has a lever. Now getting back here you can see at five foot seven, it is a little more comfortable for me back here. My knees aren't quite touching the seat back. They're pushed all the way back. You can push the seat forward to give you more space. There is also more room to kind of stretch about in the third row if you actually do need to put three people across. There's also nice, this really nice suede material on the roof, which adds to the level of luxury that you've got. You have rear seat or vents in the ceiling over here. Uh, there's some LED lighting. The materials back here are hard touch plastic, but you have cup holders back here galore, and then you also have two USB ports. So it's kind of similar to the Ascent suit or Kia also really sweated the details when it comes to third row seat passengers. So finally, getting into the back seat of the Atlas, you can see my tester has a bench seat back here. Now, surprisingly, the Atlas only seats up to seven people at maximum because the third row only sits two across as opposed to three across like the other two vehicles. Very strange considering how big the Atlas actually is. But you can see the second row here has basically the same amount of legroom as the Telluride, around 38 inches of legroom. There's almost a nearly flat floor here, so if you have to put a middle passenger here, you could easily do so. You've got two USB ports, a power outlet, and then your own set of rear seat climate control. This one doesn't have heated rear seats, but because it's a lower trim, it is available if you guys go up to the higher trim models. Surprisingly, just being an SE trim, it does have the rear window sun jays, which is nice. Hardest plastic materials here, and then you have two map pockets and then an armrest that also folds down to give you cup holders if you only wanted to put two people here. Now getting into the third row, because it doesn't have the captain's chair, because there's no you know fancy nice opening right here, so you have to slide this seat forward. Not quite as easy as the Telluride, but it's about on par with the Subaru probably. There's a lever you pull. And then getting back here, let me show you guys the space in the third row. Oh, Jesus, that. Okay, so getting back into the third row, I have to say I'm pretty disappointed with the space back here considering the size. The Telluride is the most comfortable for me in terms of the third row legroom. You can push this seat forward again if you need to give your um, third row passengers more space, but I just don't understand why VW couldn't squeeze in another middle passenger here to make this thing an eight passenger vehicle like, like its competitors. It just baffles me. Now in terms of features, there are some cup holders back here, but no USB ports. There are rear seat air vents again, and then you have plenty of headroom over here. So overall, the uh, Atlas is a little bit on the disappointing end considering the size. You have good cargo space, but the third row is definitely compromised and it really should be able to seat uh, three people across as well. So under the hood of these three SUVs, the odd man out here is definitely the Subaru. This is the only four cylinder of the trio, but it's a turbocharged engine. This is Subaru's new 2.4 liter direct injection boxer four cylinder engine. It was the first application of this new four cylinder. Subaru will be applying it to the rest of their lineup soon. It makes 260 horsepower and 277 pound feet of torque, the most torque of this trio. You can see it's got a top mounted intercooler here as air is fed in through the front grille here and then it's fed into the intercooler. This in general makes pretty good power for a four cylinder and way more torque than most of the six cylinders. It's paired with their standard symmetrical all wheel drive system going out through a linear tronic CVT transmission. Now as this one sits, it'll tow a maximum of 5,000 pounds and Subaru says it gets the best fuel economy of the trio, 20 in the city, 26 on the highway on regular grade gasoline. The curb weight on the Ascent is also the lightest of the trio. This one weighs around 4,500 pounds, so a couple hundred pounds lighter than the next heaviest Telluride. Now moving over to the Telluride, you've got a tra pretty traditional engine here. It's a 3.8 liter naturally aspirated V6 with their gasoline direct injection. That's what GDI stands for. It makes 293 horsepower, so the most powerful engine of the trio, but 262 pound feet of torque, so the least amount of torque, which is surprising considering this has the biggest engine. But again, it's a naturally aspirated engine. It all goes out through an eight speed automatic transmission that is Kia's own design. And properly equipped, this will tow a maximum of 5,000 pounds. Now the Telluride is a little bit more thirsty versus the Subaru. It's rated at 19 in the city, 24 on the highway. And as this one sits, being the fully loaded SX model with all wheel drive weighs around 4,600, 4,700 pounds. Now moving over to the Volkswagen, this is the biggest vehicle out of the three here. And it also has uh, an engine that falls mid pack. It's the company's 3.6 liter VR6 engine. So it's a strange bank angle, like a 28 degree bank angle, something like that. It's basically two three cylinders merged together. It makes 276 horsepower and 266 pound feet of torque. It's a uh, naturally aspirated engine with port injection. Now it all goes out through, again, an eight speed automatic transmission. That's a Volkswagen transmission. Uh, and when properly equipped, this will tow a maximum of 5,000 pounds. This particular one is front wheel drive. So it does get a little bit better gas mileage. 17 in the city, 24 on the highway on regular. If you guys go for the all wheel drive model, it's the thirstiest vehicle here at 16 in the city, 23 on the highway. And that's not really a surprise 
considering if you guys go for the all-wheel drive model, this one will weigh close to 5,000 pounds. This one being front-wheel drive is around 4,700 pounds. So you guys are all probably wondering, how do all three of these vehicles drive? Well, let's get on the road and see how they all compare. So to get things going, I'm gonna first start my driving impressions in the Volkswagen Atlas. This is the biggest vehicle here, but it's also the front wheel drive offering, which most people are gonna buy this with all wheel drive, but it does make the Atlas a little bit lighter and a lot less expensive versus the fully loaded one that I drove last. Now, it's been a couple of years since I drove the Atlas, and I have to say the Atlas still drives very nice, but the problem with the car is it just doesn't feel like a German car to me. Um, there are times where I'm driving this thing and I feel like I'm driving an American car. Now, they did, you know, obviously cater this vehicle for American car taste. I mean, it has a very comfortable ride quality. Um, you sit up nice and high. The seats are very wide, so they're tailored to, you know, fit our wider frames and whatnot. They're very comfortable seats, even though these are the, you know, the faux leather interior uh, and whatnot. This is still a very nice driving vehicle that I think will make a lot of people happy when they are tooling around in this thing, but getting onto this road over here, <laughs> the front wheel drive model cannot put the power down because the road's a little wet, but zero to 60 time for this car is around eight seconds with all wheel drive. It's got a pretty responsive eight speed automatic transmission, which isn't quite as responsive as the eight speed that's in the Telluride per se, but you've got very good visibility. This car has their technology package, so it has the adaptive cruise control, which is actually optional in this car. The, it does have their you know, forward emergency braking and lane keeping assist as standard, but the Kia and the Subaru you know, come with the full active suite of driver stuff, which is actually standard. You don't have to go up to a hair trim or pick an option package to get it. And overall, really what the Atlas, where the Atlas falls short for me is just in the overall you know, driving experience. It's not the most engaging to drive. It feels like I'm piling around a minivan at times it just feels very big so if you guys don't like driving big cars you're going to prefer to you know drive something that's a little bit smaller like the subaru noise levels in here are also very good vw really stressed you know low uh, road noise low wind noise low engine noise and they really i think achieve that mark this is probably one of the more refined vehicles in the vw line remember this is their class seating vehicle this is the car that's you know their their flagship suv it's the biggest thing that they currently make so moving on into the Subaru Ascent, having just got out of the Atlas, you instantly feel just how much more nimble and smaller the Ascent feels. Remember, this car is two inches narrower than the, than the other two, which does mean you have a little bit less interior space, but honestly, for the way this thing feels behind the wheel, it feels like you're driving a smaller car. Now, if you guys are coming from something like a, you know, a compact car, like a Honda Civic and whatnot, or a Toyota Corolla, this will be the easiest to drive because it feels so light, it feels so effortless, it's got a really responsive um, CVT transmission. And usually I hate CVTs, but Subaru's Linear Tronic is one of the better ones in the industry. It's got a really responsive turbocharged engine as well. It just has the most torque in the segment. You really feel that torque the instant you, you know, put your foot down in this vehicle. It just feels really energetic, uh, especially when you're looking at you know, just passing power. Now, putting your foot down here, The CVT does mimic shifts and it instantly feels so much faster than the Atlas, which had kind of a lazy, you know, wheezy V6 where you had to push the engine hard. It also vibrated a little bit. This is really refined, smooth, and it's also not coarse sounding, which is a really surprise for me. I was genuinely impressed when I drove the Ascent last year, and I'm still impressed today driving this car. This is one of the better driving cars. It has the kind of the sportiness of the Mazda CX-9, um, but it actually feels a little bit quicker and it just handles well. Really the only downside with the Subaru is the steering feel is a little bit numb. It's a little too light. It doesn't really have like a sport mode or anything like that, which I guess you don't really need something on like a vehicle like this, but it does have paddle shifters behind the steering wheel, which is good. It gives you seven virtual ratios. Now in terms of the visibility, Subaru is also well known for that. And the, the Ascent is no exception. You have a very good view out of the front, good side mirrors. Their eyesight driver assist technology is standard equipment on the Ascent. Um, so again, it's gonna add to that strong value, that strong safety quotient, and I think a lot of Subaru buyers are going to like the overall feel of this car. It's just a really well-rounded car. It's got a really good ride quality. The seats are comfortable. You can see out of it well. This is the easiest car to drive uh, on an everyday basis, and if you find your favorite back road, uh, this thing will also, you know, make some or have some fun with you in a pinch if you guys decide to, you know, push this thing a little bit. And finally, last but not least, hopping into the Telluride after just getting out of the Atlas and the Ascent. 
Immediately, I'm noticing that this vehicle splits the difference in size between the two cars. It doesn't feel quite as nimble as the Subaru, which is something I really liked about that car, but it doesn't feel quite as ponderous as the Volkswagen as well. The steering is a little bit better in this car versus the Subaru and the, the Volkswagen. It actually has some heft to it, a little bit more feel than those vehicles, and it's smooth V6. I mean, the VW's engine can get a little coarse and grainy when you push it, but Kia's, there, there were times where like I didn't even realize the engine was running. Like I, I pushed the start stop button because I thought the engine was off. And then I'm like, oh wow, the engine was actually running. Now, refinement is very high in this car. Kia really nailed it when it comes to the overall feel. It rides and drives like a German car to me. It, it just has a really solid feel to it. The ride is smooth, it's nice and quiet. You barely hear the engine. The eight-speed automatic in this car also is better tuned versus the automatic that's in the Volkswagen. It's just a very smooth transmission. It's not very you know, quick shifting, but again, this isn't a sports car. It is the only vehicle that actually has a dedicated sport mode. Now this all-wheel drive model that I'm driving, will get out of its own way quite nicely. I mean, this is not as fast as the Subaru for sure, but it is way quicker than the Volkswagen, and the engine has a nice throaty response to it. It actually makes a pretty nice snarl when you push it. So it is an enjoyable to drive vehicle. Again, not the most sportiest, but you know, it's comfortable and that's what's important. Now, the quietness in here is also good. It's very, very quiet in terms of the road noise, in terms of the wind noise, in terms of the engine noise. And you know, this thing will hustle relatively well when you start pushing it on a back road. And really the visibility is also really strong. I like the very low dashboard. It's comparable to the Subaru, which Subaru typically has the best visibility. This is better than the Volkswagen uh, easily. Good side mirrors. Kia's DriveWise package is standard on the Telluride, so you don't even have to get the full-fledged model to get their you know, driver assistance stuff or the adaptive cruise control. But really, a lot of people are gonna get in this thing. It's gonna be easy to drive doesn't feel the lightest or the sportiest, but that's okay because you don't really buy a vehicle like this, you know, to be doing, you know, attacking your favorite back roads. The Telluride is comfortable, it's competent, and it's gonna be kind of just that Goldilocks car that's just right for a lot of buyers. And I think, I really like what Kia has done with the overall driving dynamics. They've really positioned it strongly in the segment. And I'll be curious to know how this sister vehicle, the Palisade drives in comparison to the Telluride. So after spending the day driving all three of these three row family crossovers, I have to say this is probably one of the most real world comparisons that I've ever done. It's probably a question that a lot of you guys, especially new families, my generation, are facing, which three row crossover should you get? Especially when you have all three of the newest ones here. So I'm gonna talk about all their strengths and their weaknesses and then rank them based on my personal preference and just the facts from driving these three vehicles back to back. Let's first start with the Volkswagen Atlas because this is the biggest vehicle here and it's also the least expensive vehicle here at $40,200. Now of course that least expensive at or claim comes with an asterisk because this is a front wheel drive model. It's an SE technology package with the R-Line sport appearance package. So this one doesn't have the same kind of equipment that you got in the Subaru or the Telluride and from the driving dynamic portion you can see the Atlas does ride and handle well but at times it does feel like a minivan because it's so big. It's also the sluggish, the most sluggish. The V6 is definitely overtaxed by the weight of this thing and being a front wheel drive model just kind of added to the whole cheapness factor for me. I think most people who buy crossovers like this should just get all wheel drive. Keep in mind if you guys also get an SEL premium with all wheel drive, this one would be the most expensive vehicle here at just under $50,000. Now this one I would definitely rate as third. So let me go over to my second place finisher which is the Subaru Ascent. This is still a really great choice in the segment. When I first drove the Ascent last year, I found it to be a really well-rounded blend of all the strengths that I liked from the other competitors. It's got the turbo engine in this vehicle, which makes it feel like the quickest because of the, the torque. It's CVT, while isn't the choice for enthusiasts, it does put the engine in the meat of its power band. And the Ascent actually feels the sportiest to drive to me because it's the smallest and also not the, the, the narrowest vehicle here, which makes this vehicle feel a little bit smaller. Now, in terms of price, Subaru also splits the difference. Although if you look at the high end, this is the cheapest model. This limited trim is around $42,500. Spend another $2,000 if you guys want uh, the touring trim, which offers the cooled seats. All-wheel drive, remember, is standard on the Subaru where it's like a $2,000 option on the Telluride 
are on the Atlas. Really, what makes the Subaru fall short of first place for me is the fact that it looks a little like a van at times or like a bloated Outback. It just doesn't have the gotta have it factor, the cool factor that my winner has, which is the 2020 Kia Telluride because this car really makes a statement when you guys are driving it. I think it looks fantastic. I think it will stand out. It's got an interior that would really make a luxury car proud. And Kia has also priced it extremely well with this fully loaded SX model stickling for around $46,800. Now, keep in mind, this is the most expensive vehicle of the trio, but if you had fully loaded models of each, this would be 44,000, this is 46,000, and that would be 49,000. So the Kia is kind of splitting the difference. It has the biggest back seat. It has a very usable cargo area. It has the heated and cooled second row seats, which is a really nice addition. And it has the largest infotainment system with, of course, the driver assistance stuff as standard, just like it is on the Subaru, whereas Volkswagen, again, makes you pay extra for something like adaptive cruise control. But I hope you guys have enjoyed my three-way comparison between all three of these family crossover vehicles. They're all really great choices, but for me, my money would go to the 2020 Kia Telluride. If you're also looking to see the latest cars I'm testing, be sure to follow me on Instagram at redline underscore reviews. Like us on Facebook, and as always, guys, please keep subscribing to the Redline Reviews YouTube channel for all the latest reviews. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you all in the next video.